Hello there. This is Angelo John Lewis for the Sacred Inclusion Network podcast. And in case you're not familiar with us, the Sacred Inclusion Network is a network of folks who believe in the sacred and honoring it in all dimensions of life. And we are true to our roots as a network that's formally called the Diversity and Spirituality Network. And if you'd like to know more about us, please visit our website, sacredinclusion.com. Today, I'm enormously privileged to interview the esteemed <laughs> Jim Hickman. <laughs> and usually with these things, uh, I ask somebody to send me a bio explaining what they want me to say about them. But I love Jim's um, bio so much, I'm going to ask Jim to introduce himself by reading the first, and Jim's a writer, by the way, so maybe that's why he's so eloquent. But anyway, Jim, if you would read the first three paragraphs of your bio and uh, tell the people who you are. Thank you. Um, well, I'll begin with, um, well, it's a good thing I'm reading it because at <laughs> my age, sometimes I forget what happened 60 years ago. Um, but I, I don't know if I've ever been called esteemed before. So that's a, that's a you know, a, a great accomplishment. <laughs> I want to, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about my experience in life that has brought us to this particular event. Um, and I will, I, um, after he's done with that, I will fill in the formal part that he may not, um, may be too, too shy or, um, I don't know, modest, to, to, because it's quite impressive. Please, Jim. Um, but as I wrote in my little bio, um, and and to give you, all of you listeners and viewers, you know, some context for where we are. I was born at the beginning of the Cold War, 1947. Um, and my father was a career military officer. So I had a a significant influence in my life around the military confrontation between the Soviet Union and the United States. Um, and as a part of what emerged in my awareness um, as the Vietnam War unfolded, I became an activist opposing the war. And it taught me a lot about the power of people to affect U.S. foreign policy. And it's something that I today um, encourage in the teaching I do, especially with young people, that it is up to us to make changes in the world. Don't depend on governments. Um, governments respond to us and we need to give them um, direction in a sense. So in the 70s and 80s, I was a leader in the citizen diplomacy movement that worked to overcome fears and misperceptions um, to reduce the nuclear tensions between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. I remember in those days, a common refrain was what we called the fear of frying. It's a part of what stimulated hundreds of thousands of us to travel to the Soviet Union, create uh, um, programs between the two countries to, to uh, attempt to um, um, create a different kind of psychological and, and mental um, relationship between the two countries. I was director of the Esalen Institute Soviet American Exchange Program in the early 80s that brought together artists, scientists, astronauts, and politicians from both countries when official channels were frozen by the Cold War. And in fact, um, my colleagues, Michael and Dulcy Murphy, um, the, uh, who were essential um, leaders at Esalen, had connections in the White House in those days, and we were privately encouraged um, to continue doing what we were doing, because as one um, uh, Soviet advisor to the president told us, our relationship is going to be frozen for quite some time. It's up to people like you to keep the communication going. During that same period, I pursued personal growth studies and developed a regular meditation practice. Now, as a result of my being, in a sense, an activist, uh, anti-war um, organizer, I had moved into 
an area of research that generally is called parapsychology that we at Esalen um, rephrased in, in conjunction with our Soviet colleagues to say uh, human potential and what the Soviets called human hidden reserves. Hmm. So with my 15 years of research in parapsychology and my studies in human dolphin communication, um, I delved into the sciences, neuropsychology, um, epigenetics, quantum physics, evolutionary biology, and I came to understand that our choice of attitudes and beliefs are the determinants in our experience of success and happiness. I spent 30 years in the international business and nonprofit sectors. I was a telecommunications executive assisting in converting Soviet military factories to non-military export goods production and established a small consulting firm with a special interest in socially responsible investments. I was vice president of the Gorbachev Foundation um, and I worked there for with President Gorbachev on some of his international uh, programs and was his personal aide during his 1992 U.S. speaking tour. From 1996 to 2011, I, was, I served on the executive committee of CDC Development Solutions, now called Pixera Global, that developed enterprises and NGOs in emerging and transitional economies. Through most of this time, I worked with a colleague, Jim Garrison, who equally was concerned with the international arena and how we might bring together leader, thought leaders to address global problems in new ways. And out of that, he and I co-founded Ubiquity University in 2012 where I'm currently a professor of neuroscience and serve as its chairman of the board. And it's out of that experience that this particular podcast has emerged. Yeah, you covered all the bases, Jim. So I, those of you that listen to our podcast regularly, I get good guests, don't I? <laughs> I'm giving myself a pat on the back. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Jim, um, I, I should underscore that um, um, the, sort of the context of our conversation, what I've last asked you to talk about, um, is a relationship. What we call we call uh, I'm, we're calling it applied neurobiology, which is kind of your specialty, but also as it applied to this whole field, I'll call it, of um, spiritual evolution, shall we say? Um, and I think you have a lot to say about that. Um, so I, you, you you kind of mentioned this in the beginnings, but let me start with this simple question and then we'll get to um, maybe some more um, technical experiential stuff. You have a lot of experience. Uh, you've been involved in um, citizen diplomacy, uh, Soviet US relationships, you've been an entrepreneur, you've done a lot of different things and now your focus is neurobiology. I'm just curious briefly, how did you come to that and why do you think that's important for people in the 21st century? Um, I'd say there are two or three different elements. One is, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, some years ago, I began to practice meditation. I really was influenced and first taught by Michael Murphy, the founder of Esalen Institute, who I have always considered as a born contemplative. Um, it's the natural state for him in his life. And he takes that frame of mind into all of what he does in the world. And I learned that from him. Um, and it became very important to me in dealing with the Soviets. There were various kinds of projects um, that more learned and experienced Soviet experts than myself always said, you can't do that. Soviets will never let you do that. And, and for a variety of reasons, these, these projects moved forward successfully. And I learned that the attitude is really important to the success of who we are in the world. Um, and, and that then drove me deeper into an examination of my own beliefs, attitudes, 
et cetera, um, and how that affects, in a sense, my brain. It's the neuroscience now of our entire system that can inform us about how we can create a world, both internally and externally, that is the kind of living situation we all aspire toward. And so um, um, I see neuroscience and the education of people about the degrees of neuroscience and the transcendent world, in a sense, um, that it is an important piece of the evolutionary unfoldment that I think most of us feel is happening, that we're in the middle of now, as a society, as a civilization, as a, as a, as a species, in a sense. And so there's the social side, where, you know, dramatic changes are occurring within our own culture and other cultures around the world. And at the same time, our brain is opening parts of itself to opportunities for change that we didn't know were there 20 years ago. Just as a caveat, I would say we've learned more about the brain in the last 20 years than we've known in the five billion years that life has emerged on this planet. And it's time that that knowledge becomes more a part of our cultural consciousness because, as I was saying to you earlier, the first time I took a, a course in brain physiology, it might have been my junior year in high school, and we touched a bit on the brain, and I was told, I was taught, that the rule of, of, of brain physiology and development is that by the time you're about 23, the brain is set. It has established itself. You can never change it. So that was the dominant view up until about 20 or 25 years ago. And what we've now learned is that from the day you're conceived, not just born, but from the day you're conceived to the day you die, the brain is a sculpting, a sculptural um, unfoldment that we can consciously, if we intend and pay attention to the possibilities of restructuring how our brain works both functionally and appears to the world. So that, you know, has intrigued me now um, as a teaching that is very important uh, in this particular time. Uh, Jim, we're going to get to some slides that you have, but you know, what you said prompted the, the following thought in my mind. As you know, um, we're in a time of cataclysmic change, <clears throat> and a lot of people are trying to um, uh, create new social systems, new organizational systems, um, etc., all of which is fine and dandy. At the same time, what you seem to be implying is that in order to be able to really create these possibilities, we have to create our brain. We have to change our brain. We have to create a new ways of looking at things. Um, because the old ways aren't working. Is that a fair um, sort of cheap distillation? Well, I think it's um, it's more overstated than I would say. <laughs> I would say that in line with the dramatic changes that are underway, our capacity to shift the way we believe, feel, relate to one another, which is a brain-based function, um, is unfolding in a way that we can shift it dramatically. And by doing that, we, in a sense, support the cultural evolution in a way that it will not be supported without certain changes internally mm. that reflect mm. how we want to be externally. And a lot of that is brain-based. Yeah, well said. And, and I'm reminded of the, of the uh, title of uh, Peter Russell's book that was in the 70s, The Global Brain, The Individual Brain and the Global Brain. In any event, um, I don't even want—I don't want to stop your role here. You've got these wonderful slides. I could ask you my questions, but um, you know, uh, I could do it. How do you want to do this? How do you want to go forward? Why don't you ask me a couple of questions, and I'll cover them as I go through the slides. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, as you know, um, I am um, preoccupied, perhaps more so than is useful to myself, around about the spiritual and religious dynamics of life. And um, from talking to you earlier, I. I the question I want to ask you, is there a neurological or evolutionary basis for the subjective experiences that people categorize as religious or spiritual? 
you shall I start with that yeah so here's what I'd like to do there are certain simple principles of how the brain operates that I'd like to cover in the beginning just so we know as I use certain terms what it refers to and secondly I want to just um, add the caveat that as we're learning in most of science we don't know mm. a lot of what's happening what, what I'm going to reflect is um, a degree of what we do know and can act upon understanding that new th new insights emerge regularly and shift us just a little bit um, so with that let me just go to um, a couple of slides here and this is sort of the the essential elements I'm going to cover some principles of neuroscience and then some other things we'll get to as I move along. I don't need to spend time on them now. But again, I just want to show you a few illustrations of how we're put together. And for those of you who are only listening, I'll describe it well enough, I think, that you'll understand. But neuroscience generally is the scientific study of the nervous system at the, at the peak of which is the brain. It's an, and within the brain, it's a complex network of neurons, which I'll describe in just a minute, that um, are responsible for sending information to all parts of the body and getting information back and acting on it. And this allows us to have a central management system, in a sense, that we can adjust and it affects the entire system. Um, I want to just talk briefly about the fundamental building blocks of this because this is where change can actually occur and it relates to some of the fundamental structures that have emerged out of quantum physics in recent years so within the brain we've got you know the numbers um are arguable but 80 to 100 million um, neurons, each one of which is connected to a wide network of other neurons so that, as, as neuroscientists say, there are more connections in the brain than there are stars in the universe. Wow. It seems to be the most complex entity that we have yet identified in physical reality. So what happens is as you have a thought, a feeling, an idea, etc., it's all related to a series of electrical impulses that travel through these neurons and, and are communicated to other neurons through what is called, um, through electrical impulses um, on a synapse, which is a small um, space from one neuron to the other. And the reason I emphasize that is that a quantum physicist friend of mine at UC Berkeley has said that sometimes this communication is done always through neurotransmitters, uh, kind of chemicals that go from one neuron to the, to the receptor in the next neuron. And some of these neurotransmitters are actually larger in physical size than the receptor which absorbs it into the other neuron. And he postulates the only way that can be done is on the quantum world. In other words, as we know about quantum physics, in that world that's fundamental to the manifestation of physical matter, it is the world of all possibilities. It isn't yet manifest into physical reality. And if this is true, then our ideas, our, our fundamental structure and function is happening at a quantum level. And that's very important to us when we think about many of the practices today about how imagery and um, affirmations, etc., are really important to who we're becoming. And if you go back to the quantum world, that's true because the quantum world, as we know, is a world of possibilities. And until some, um, until some thinking 
process merges with the quantum world, it doesn't manifest into physical reality. So, you know, I can explain a little bit more later, but this is important is why I wanted to show how the neurons connect to one another. Um, and then they, and they form networks. And a part of what happens in those networks is that a network of correct, of connected neurons um, that we sometimes call a sort of neuronal community represents a certain degree of, of beliefs and, and emotions, etc. And to change that, we actually reconstruct those communities. Mm -hmm. When you change the way you think about yourself, for example, this is one of the common practices. Oh, I'm not good enough. My parents always said I couldn't ever make it. So when you do that over and over and over again, your brain connects a, a series of neurons into a big community that solidifies that idea in your brain. Mm -hmm. Now, you can change that. That's what's important that we mm -hmm. found out. And when you do that, it disconnects those neurons from the community, and they're free to form a new community around I'm a great guy. I can do anything. I'm successful, etc. So that kind of um, supports the um, certain spiritual practices, basically. You mentioned yeah. affirmations and things of that nature. You have an opportunity to change yourself. Change yeah, exactly. Brain. So one of the important parts of what we've learned about how the brain functions, because it affects each of us every day, is the certain centers of the brain that uh, um, that. I start with the amygdala, a small little almond-shaped um, structure in the center of the brain um, that is a key role in processing emotions. And the amygdala, which has been there for 250,000 years, is that part of the brain that is the fight or flight response. And so it represents that part of what we call the caveman or cave person or Stone Age brain that developed very specifically in the service of evolution to make sure that we survived so the species could live. And the amygdala was a primary, what they call alarm bell of our awareness so that if a threat to our existence came along, the amygdala um, immediately began sending chemicals all over the body to say either fight, if it was, you know, a tribal thing and you wanted to conquer, or flee if it was a big lion that was about to eat you. Now, it still responds today similarly. And most of our threats in life are no longer related to evolutionary survival. And so the amygdala is one part of the brain that we want to calm down a bit so that when your boss doesn't appreciate your work and starts, you know, you're too late every day and you're going, <laughs> that's the amygdala going off. And you, you want to calm that down a bit with, and I'll get into it, a little bit of meditation, et cetera. Um, and then secondly, we want to talk about the limbic system, which the amygdala is a part of. Because an overactive limbic system um, can be, it's physically and psychologically dangerous, but it can be shifted. Just one study showed a 12-week yoga training program lowered the activity of the amygdala. And we know now that mindfulness-based meditation reduces amygdala activity and calms the limbic system. So this is an example of how we're learning to re-sculpt the brain in a sense. And a part of this, as I referred to, was a Stone Age survival drive that also um, ingrained in our brain, in our self, in a sense, a negativity bias, a bias toward remembering negative experiences that threatened our survival over positive ones. Were you going to say something, Angela? Yeah, I was going to ask a question. Um, you know, my high school understanding of the limbic system means that it affects the emotions a lot. And uh, I'm trying to make a connection when you were talking about fright and flight um, sort of activities that happened when we were when we were cavemen. Uh, the importance of 
regulating that is important back then and now. Uh, maybe you could say a little bit about that. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't ask the question artfully, but no, but but you're absolutely right. And the limbic system, remember, contains the amygdala. Yes. So when you talk about the emotional response, we're talking about various components of the limbic system that are activated when these kinds of threats or emotional excitement happens. There's a, I have an example here because it relates to so much of what's happening uh, uh, these weeks is that they show that when you see an angry face, not just somebody's anger with you, but you see a picture of an angry face or you hear angry words, the limbic system generates stress chemicals that make us flight, fight or run. And, and so this is, you know, there's an important um, element here because um, generally it's held that overall the brain doesn't tell a difference between the imagination and external reality. So much of this research shows just when we're given an idea of something, it activates the limbic system, the amygdala, etc. And so, as you pointed out, um, when the limbic system in this case is activated and anger comes up, that generates more anger. And then the angrier a group of people get, the greater the possibility that violence will erupt. And this is what we're seeing in today's world in various places. And this is, again, it goes back much to the Stone Age brain that we needed at one point for, for um, our survival and that today is largely understood by a number of the political leaders around the world and they use that mm. because we know that we can stimulate groups of people to get angrier and then get violent and then do what we want them to do and da 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 da. Jim, let, so, me, ask, let me ask you, uh, let, me, let me ask you a kind of a country simple question, which I think is important here. Um, you mentioned that um, many years ago or 20 years ago, the, the brain was thought to be fixed. It, it, didn't, it didn't evolve and it just sort of stayed the same. There's no possibility for learning. At the same time, um, people a long time ago, and maybe some, some of them still think today, they think of the brain as a physical organism, an organism that um, has no connection to anything else but physical matter, reality. Can, can you address this? Well, you know, it's partly your, your bringing up this whole question of science versus belief and and wherever you fit on that spectrum you will um, relate to one idea that the brain is just a physical thing that that regulates our drug flow or the other side of the spectrum that says the brain in a sense the brain body because we now know that the brain doesn't act alone. It is intimately connected to the heart. In fact, there are so, as many neurons in the heart as there are in the brain. Wow. They, they function a little differently, but the brain-heart connection is what really um, regulates so much of what we believe, um, um, feel, act, imagine, et cetera. And so as we learn more about it, and then what's come up recently is the gut is the third part of the heart brain mind. Mm. And um, so we're now seeing that there's more intimate connections between the brain and all pieces of the body that actually contribute to thoughts, to emotions, to behavior, et cetera, than we ever thought before. And of course, um, um, so then it goes back to, um, if, I, if I relate to, for example, I'll talk about it in a minute, if I, relate, if I relate to the spiritual world as something outside of me, then I'm, I would be prone to believe that the brain is just a piece of physical matter that keeps us walking around until we die and ascend into something bigger. There's another way of looking at it, which a lot of the research now points to, that the function of the brain and the other parts of the body in which it's connected, the brain heart, for example, um, we can see neurological correlates to transcendent experiences. And we can identify um, 
neurological functioning that seems to give rise to the opportunity for transcendent experiences. Uh, so there is a, in this, from this frame of, of reference, there's a direct link to brain, mind. It's not all connect, it's not all contained inside the body. But what we also know now is the body is no longer contained inside of our physical structure. There's a, there's a field outside of us that carries information about who we are and who the others are that we use to communicate, you know, blah, blah, blah. So um, I'm just trying to point out that, you know, a part of it is just where our, our attention goes in terms of, of information that comes into our lives. And um, we, we tend to segment it in different ways so that it's easy to say, when I go to church and I pray, I'm talking to God and um, my brain isn't necessarily involved. Versus you go to church, pray and meditate, and as um, is told in some of the scriptures, um, the, the sense of self and e ego sometimes begins to dissolve and you have a direct experience of something much bigger and grander than just what happens in the body. And this, um, as I'll mention a little later, is a part of the research that's come out of um, research with Franciscan nuns who, you know, pray four to six hours a day and have a devout religious practice and, and describe how they have an experience of transcendence that doesn't necessarily deny the body. On the other hand, you have, you know, some of the more... Um, um, uh, let's say, uh, well, some practices that um, emphasize that physicality is a restriction to transcendence. And so the denial of the physical world is an important component of certain practices in order to give you, in a sense, more access to that experience where the ego leaves the sense of self dissolves and and you become, in a sense, one with the greater being or the universe. Does that help answer your question? It helps. Obviously, it, it raises um, other uh, sort of <laughs> questions in me, uh, but that's that's the nature of this this field that you're talking about. It's emerging. As you said in, in the outset, it's like we have some ideas. We don't really know the, full, the whole answer. And um, I just love that in a human being because a lot of times material sciences, it's like, this is fixed. It's this, that, and the other thing. An important component is we don't know. But here's 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 our best ideas. But let me ask you this question: um, You you mentioned the uh, research with the Frances Franciscan nuns. Um, apparently, there's a whole body of research that um, shows that uh, meditation and various spiritual practices does change the brain. Can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah. Let me give you a little uh, one last point to talk about neuroplasticity, yes. a crucial element of now neuroscience, which basically is the term that describes what we've been talking about. Right. The ability of neurons to forge new connections. We're able to change the way our brain functions and, and in a sense, is, designed, is, is sculpted uh, through conscious thought and volition. And that directed mental activity what I call the conscious, consistent, and intentional repetition of carefully chosen thoughts and actions and, and feelings mm. for the explicit purpose of building new neurons is the basis for behavioral change. And we call this self-directed neuroplasticity. And, um, and I've found that William James captured this well in the Principles of Psychology, where he says, attention allows us moment to moment, moment to moment, to choose and sculpt how our ever-changing minds will work, to choose who we will be in the next moment in a very real sense. That's up to us, and, and we participate in it. You know, that's so um, beautiful because it, I'm interrupting you a little bit, but that takes the um, sort of the woo-woo aspect of it, uh, what you just said. It's like sustained attention. I can't quote you exactly, but people can, people can, can refer to that as mindfulness. They can refer to that as meditation. 
They can refer to it as all manner of things, but specifically, it's about changing the field of attention. So in that regard, you know, attention is like a spotlight. It focuses, it, it lights up whatever it rests upon. So that's an important component of our restructuring of who we are today so that we can become who we really want to be. And neuroplasticity is heightened. In a sense, the brain becomes more sculptable mm. as attention pulls into it the field of focused awareness. Directed attention skillfully is a fundamental way to shape the brain. And one of the many benefits of meditation, mindfulness training in this regard, is the development of skillful attention. So you asked about meditation, I want to give a brief summary. Um, and it's a growing field, subfield of neurological research. Relatively um, new, relatively new and, field. Yeah, and part of it is that we now have the technology to image how the brain is working during feeling states. And so applying that to, for example, people practiced in mindfulness meditation, we can show that it's useful in managing stress and anxiety, it reduces depression, it improves your mood, it changes the brain structure and function, and it contributes to a more coherent and healthy sense of self and identity. So a recent study um, showed that it actually um, increases the thickness of certain parts of the brain that reduces um, certain psychological uh, um, contributions to worry, state anxiety, and depression. Um, and there's, you know, and there are other things, but I wanted to um, identify that other types of meditation, it's not just mindfulness, right. but Kundalini Yoga, for example, has been shown to decrease arousal when dealing with unpleasant situations. In other words, it affects the limbic system. Yes. Because that's what the rouser happens and unpleasant. And, and a kind of, of meditation, a certain kind of contemplation, gives you the capacity to reduce that. And then experienced meditators, um, they've shown that it, it has a stronger coupling with various regions of the brain, which continues even when they're not meditating. As, and over time, it increases certain parts of the brain's relationship that improves communication between the cortex um, and all the other areas of the brain. So that's a part of this whole sculpting process. And studies have shown that, um, you know, there's a variety of other things, um, including it makes it possible for higher neuroplasticity over longer periods of time uh, with certain meditation practices. It also enhances memory capacity. Um, but you asked about evolution a bit, and I wanted to speak to that uh, for a moment. Can I go ahead, or do you have another question? Go ahead, Jim. The floor is yours. So we talked, you talked in the beginning about the emergence of both dramatic changes and to some degree what could be seen as evolutionary unfoldment in the culture of societies generally around the world. And depending on whether you're a, um, an indigenous person in the jungles of the Amazon or, you know, a, an accomplished um, CEO in a big multinational corporation, these changes are affecting all of us. Mm. And it's emerging um, in a way that, in my, from my point of view, we have the opportunity to consciously participate in, not just let it you know, go to the whims of whoever has control these days. So I want to just show how over time this has emerged. Remember, 15 billion years ago, the universe um, came into existence in a second. And for about 10 billion years, it emerged into an evolutionary spiral that eventually gave birth to life on Earth. So we're talking, you know, 15 billion years of, of emerging unfoldment. And then once life on Earth 
emerged, it took about 4 billion years before the modern human appeared with a brain greater than any before. So we're now talking about, you know, the last 250,000 years. We have unfolded as a species in a way that no other species on earth seemed to have ever done. And a part of that is um, the emergence of a brain with, with a capacity for self-transformation tra and inwardly directed change. And from the very beginning, it has exhibited a sense of spiritual awareness. Um, we find early, several thousand years ago, evidence of sh shaman practices in, in cultures of those days in which a shaman um, emerged as a leader of the spiritual life, in a sense, within the culture. And um, for thousands of years, this impulse for transcendent aspect of human ex existence has expressed itself in the mystery schools, for example. And then in more organized religion from Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, etc., um, all of which have something in common in which they describe a path towards spiritual transformation. In some cases, the emphasis is after physical death. In other cases, it's recognized that the, that the opportunity, the experience itself, um, can occur within our physical life. And so that we become transcendent in a way. And in, in um, the last 20, 25 years, more and more spiritual teachers from the East who were brought up in the deny the physical body um, um, paradigm have come into the world to say what's more important is to access this transcendent self and then bring it into the world. Mm -hmm. The world needs the spiritual side mm -hmm. more active in our decision making in our daily life. And now, as I said earlier, we have the technology that allows us to look at how the brain responds to these experiences and maybe begins to tell us more about how we can create it in a more functional way. The, the study of this is generally called neurotheology. And um, in, in this presentation, I've included a number of references so people can look more deeply <coughs> into this. But again, you know, the Buddhists call this spiritual um, contemplation that triggers a certain um, religious experience or transcendent experience as oneness with the universe. So it's come, it's been in our, in our language, in our perception, in our belief systems um, for thousands of years. And now, um, as you, you asked about the Carmelite nuns, and I have here that, that the study that I referred to is purported to show that religious and spiritual experiences include several brain regions. And again, you know, this is important because of the imagination. It's not like, oh, I'm having a transcendent experience. Let me get down to the Faraday cage and you guys measure everything. What happens is, in this case, they took the nuns and asked them to recall, and as well as they could, re-experience past mystical states. And we looked at what happened. It reminds me of my early years in studying um, exceptional people who had some kind of psychic abilities, let's say, either healing or they could sense thoughts at a distance, etc. And while we studied a number of people who had real talent in this area. The challenge was when you get them into an um, experimental setting, you got all the controls in place, often they can't perform. Um, and so what that led several of us into was what we got to do is train ourselves to do these things. Because as a scientist, I could do the same thing in a Faraday cage as I could do in my living room because that, that's my goal here. And so several of us trained ourselves in simple little tasks for that kind of research. And this is the same um, challenge we have with this. All we can do is 
well, there are two things. First, we can take meditators and say, go into a state of bliss or, or pursue your mindfulness practice. And we can see what it does in the brain and the body. And that's very important. The other thing is we can look at from the other side, something that um, Andrew Newberg and Mark Waldman, um, Waldman have done well where there's a good book they wrote called How God Changes Your Brain, where they took people in a, in a study situation and had them think about God, had them imagine, um, in a sense, what they called spiritual contemplation. And, and they found that it changed his brain in a profoundly different way than just normal, in a sense, meditation, that the idea of focusing on God, whatever that means to you or me or the practitioner, moved the attention and the, and the neural activity into a place that something transcendent began to emerge or descend, depending on your point of view. And, and what they also found that it isn't just about God, but it's about big ideas, mm -hmm. contemplating the Big Bang, for example. I once had a, I was studying a psychic who did psychic readings for people, and and in her one of her psychic readings for me, she said, you know, you have the capacity to remember the birth of the universe, mm -hmm. and here's why. Everything that now exists was created in that instant of the Big Bang which means that you and I are made up of atoms that were born in the Big Bang. And so in, in um, certain contemplative practices, um, one of the siddhis or powers is called um, the animan siddhi, or the power to focus the mind to the fundamental structure of matter. And this is a practice that yogis had used for thousands of years. And so when you translate that into what the psychic was saying, we have the capacity to focus our attention into the fundamental structures of who we are and where we came from, and in a sense, remember when it all happened. So these are capacities, you know, we're studying now to find out how it's reflected in the brain. And we know that religious and spiritual com contemplation changes the brain in profoundly different ways. And one of the important things is that you have to have just the right balance of frontal and limbic activity to have a positive perception or experience of God. So um, maybe that means through biofeedback or something else, we can begin to structure our brain to give us more of that. We don't know yet. What we know is the experience itself has a signature. And whether or not that same signature can be created to create the experience, we don't know. It, there may be much more to it than that. Um, Jim, I, I, we, um, <laughs> we touch on a lot of things. I hope people are as excited as I am. Um, I want you to um, talk about some of the work that you're doing um, with, with Ubiquity University. I know you have a class coming up in the fall. And I do want to let people to know if your appetite is whetted for the application of this. On February 20th, um, Jim is going to lead us Sacred Inclusion ITES. Um, and um, we're tentatively calling it Applied um, neurobi neuro 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 Neuroscience Hacking the Brain for Enlightenment or something. We'll probably change the name, but that's the basic idea. But we're going to get real experiential about this. Um, Jim, can you tell us a little bit about what you're, what's going on with Ubiquity University and some of the things you're doing? Because I know you're teaching, you teach a class on this regularly. Please tell us. Yeah, let me segue that with one more personal experience. Um, as most of us know now, um, psychedelic drugs have become a focal of attention or research in a variety of areas, primarily because we're finding that certain psychedelic drugs in used in therapy seem to be very effective. For many of us in my generation, our introduction into the transcendent world came through LSD <laughs> or something else, right? It's really and so, very interesting. I, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm, this is just a brief segue to have you talk about that. But, um, you know, 
in the early days when you and I were younger, when LSD was coming out and Timothy Leary and all these sort of people were doing, there was just a small handful of researchers like Jim Houston and her, her late husband, I can't remember his name, um, that were studying um, psychedelics in the brain, I'll, I'll call it. And then it just sort of went underground and disappeared. And now it's back. So please, Jim, I interrupted you. Well, you know, it's, in, it's interesting because, of course, there are many elements to this kind of thing. And what happens is that, that the psychedelics become popular with the Learys and the Alperts, etc. It becomes used widely and to some degree abused. You know, for example, yes. I had dozens, I won't, I won't say the truth because it's more than anyone <laughs> could believe, yeah, of, <laughs> of, of psychedelic experiences. And it wasn't until I met Stan Groff at Esalen. I met Stan, yeah. And Stan, as you may know, was one of the pioneers yes. of psychedelic research when he was in Czechoslovakia. And then when he came here, he went to the um, Maryland um, Psychiatric Center where he did legal research there with it. Um, and, and then at, at a certain point, he became resident of Esalen where I met him where I, I had met him earlier at, at the Maryland Psychiatric Center. But um, once he was out there, I had my first guided LSD trip. And as you probably remember, it was one of the things we always said, but most of us couldn't do. Oh, a guided experience. You got to have a good, you know, guide to do this right and all that stuff. Um, and that guided experience was the most dramatic experience of of a psychedelic that I have ever had. Um, and I understood the value of having a, um, a, a well-educated and experienced mm. elder, in a sense, help me move into deep parts of myself that the psychedelic opened up that I wouldn't necessarily have dived into if I had been just alone. Mm. And that's what we're now finding today, and I won't spend much more time on it, but what we're finding today is that one of the first little things we've, we've seen, and this is all preliminary, is that psychedelics seem to alter consciousness by disorganizing our brain activity. In a sense, our normal brain activity has its boundaries, and it's on its own playing field. And to get outside of the boundaries is, is not easy. And that's one of the things psychedelic drugs does do. It breaks down those boundaries so you can move into a much bigger realm of consciousness. And we're finding and, and we're seeing uh, the neurological correlates to that and some of the research that's going on now. So to get to your last question, um, as I mentioned, you know, with others, um, I'm a part of Ubiquity University. Before you get into that, take us take us through this. this. This is good stuff. Do what? Take us through this slide here that you're about to skip. I, I'm going to gonna, get to that because okay, that's right, what good. that's what my course is about. Um, and and we established the university to develop an educational approach for the 21st century because most of what's going on in universities is for the last century. And some of that is applicable, but basically none of us know what's coming, but it's going to be com complex and surprising. And we want to develop the parts of ourselves that are more related to shifting sands in the reality of who we are and where we're going, like resilience, like the capacity to deal with change, like what you pointed to earlier, um, the the value of differences, honoring differences instead of resisting them and battling each other. Mm. We got to recognize we have differences among us and we need to collaborate on all of that in order to create a cooperative future for all of us and the rest of the living species on this planet. Mm. Um, so in my course um, at Ubiquity, in addition to being one of the um, um, executives, I'm chairman of the chairperson of the board um, and treasurer. Um, I teach a course once a year about on the application of what we know from neuroscience to our daily life, because that's what I'm most interested in. 
And, um, and so there are a couple of practices I teach that are easy to do. As I mentioned earlier, there's something called negativity bias in our world in which we tend to remember negative experiences and get alerted to those much more quickly than positive ones. And so a first experience, a first practice is taking in the good. You did it a little while ago. You said, um, you were saying something, you said, I'm patting myself on the back. Well, the thing is, that is an essential practice mm -hmm. to unfolding who you really are. Mm -hmm. And the taking in the good, which as we know, often is discouraged in our culture. Oh, you know, here's it's, um, somebody says, oh, you look so good today. And I say, oh, well, it's nothing. Oh, yeah. I, I got, <laughs> yeah, I got my pants at the second hand store. And so the practice is whenever that happens, uh. to just stop for 10 to 20 seconds and take in the feeling, acknowledge to yourself mm. that that is true. I'm looking good today. I feel really good about that. This is who I really am. Only a few seconds is all it takes. Mm. And the more you do that regularly, the more you create neural pathways around that image of yourself and the positive opportunities you have in the world. Mm. So I, we call it taking in the good. A second thing it is something I uh, named myself that I learned, which I call back pocket positivity. So another part of this is when a negative experience comes up, I'm in a, you know, a simple thing, like I'm in a line at the bank and whoever's in front of me is just doing all kinds of crazy things. And I'm like, come on, I got stuff to do. Get, get, your, get your cash and get out of there. Um, you know, or, you're driving down the road and somebody cuts you, hey, who are you? That's a chance for what I call back pocket positivity. And this just requires in advance, we take a couple of moments and remember some of the best experiences we've ever had in our lives. Positive things we then take into ourselves and what I call, we put it in our back pocket so that when those moments arrive, we're alert. Oh, oh, quick, pull out my positive experience and and re replace that negativity I'm in the midst of with a positive thing. So I have one when I was in high school. I was a pretty good basketball player. And there was one time in a championship game, I got the ball and we're going down the field and my good friend is going next to me and I'm about to make a laugh. And I do a behind the back pass to my friend and he dumps it in the, and the crowd goes wild. And I just felt so good and I can still remember it. You can probably sense it when I describe it. That's one of my back pocket positive experiences. I keep there and I just, when something comes up, I just remember, whoa, I was so good. That felt so good. Okay, then the next thing is gratitude. I mean, most everyone's heard now about all the gratitude stuff. Um, and so I just wanna um, emphasize this with this. Um, Jeff Walker says, if gratitude were a drug, it would be the most popular drug in the world because of what it does for us. It makes us happier. It makes people like us. It strengthens our emotions. It boosts our career and it makes us healthier. Mm -hmm. Here's a good little chart to look at all the benefits of gratitude. There are 31 in this chart, emotional, social, personality, health, career, etc., all of which contribute to um, a degree of our happiness. So, um, daily gratitude acknowledgement. Mm. You can write it down. You know, writing is really important in a lot of these practices. Some of us don't do it. I'll tell you, when I was teaching this to a group of younger people in um, uh, La Paz, Bolivia, a couple of months ago, and I'm, you know, not the technology generation. And, I, and I've learned that writing affects memory far greater than typing in an electronic device. Mm. And there are increasing numbers of professors in US universities that are outlawing electronic devices in their lectures because they find people who take notes by hand get better grades than those who put it in. So I say, I always say, now take out a sheet of paper and think of three friends you know and write down under each name three things you're grateful for, for each one of them. Mm. 
And so the, so they're all working on it. And there's a guy in the back. He's got his little um, iPhone and he's typing on it. And I say, um, you know, do you have a piece of paper you could write? On? And he said, I am right now in live contact with three of my friends. I'm telling them right now how grateful I am. And see, that's, that's where we learn from one another. Yes. I now understand better how that technology could be used. Mm -hmm. It doesn't deny that writing has a better effect. You know what I mean? Yes. But but yes. this is where this is where the knowledge is expanding because of our experience. Then random acts of kindness. You know, there's a Japanese group that did research on the effect of just being nice to each other randomly has a huge positive impact in our lives. And especially, you know, practice a random act of and tell no one about it. Just something you do going down the street, you help somebody, you know. Um, and then the last thing I always emphasize is smile. Now, the problem with this is I try it with my mask on and I'm trying to, I'm trying in the mirror, I'm trying to get the smile to, to uh, affect my eyes and my, so when I smile at people, they'll see I'm smiling at them. Um, but a smile is contagious and the act of smiling activates neural, neural messaging that benefits your health and happiness. So the, the, um, the guideline is activate metal states and install them as neural traits. And that requires to spend a few seconds on installing them into your system, really feeling, feeling that positive experience you had and, 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 or imagining in great detail, including emotional and all the senses, the kind of person you're aspiring to become and see that and know that is who I am. And that moves us into that opportunity. That's wonderful, Jim. Um, if you haven't been wet, um, your appetite is not wet for more. Um, I don't know what's wrong with you, but uh, anyway, um, smile anyway. Um, <laughs> I want to yeah. tell people a little bit about the Sacred Inclusion Network and, um, you know, I'll plug the course and also um, Jim's thing a little bit more. And um, then I'll say goodbye formally to Jim. Um, if you want to know more about the Sacred Inclusion Network, the simplest way is to go to our website, sacredinclusion.com. On the third Saturday of every month, uh, we have what's called an online community exploration. And on February 20th, Jim is going to do his on applied neuro, neurobiology, neuro, neuropsychology, whatever, neuro something. And um, we're going we're gonna, to, it's going to be experiential. Please join us. Um, another way to get involved in the network, um, if you want, um, by the way, by the time this comes out, we're going to have a social um, social network type of thing where there'll be more different activities um, that are more um, sort of long lasting. Also, if you want to support the podcast, support the network, um, simplest way to do is to go to patreon.com, look for Sacred Inclusion Network. Um, Jim, it's been an enormous privilege. I'm so excited to get to know you a little bit more, and I'm excited about your work and um, sharing it with the world. Thank you so very much. So um, one thing I want to uh, just your comment on, as the listeners heard and some people saw, there are these slides in which a lot of this data is contained. Yes, right. I'd love to allow people to have their own copy as a PDF. So. Um, you might say something about how we might make that happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll either, um, I can put your um, email address in there directly. Okay. I'll, I'll put that in the show notes and I'll, make sure <laughs> I'll even put that in the in the actual video itself. Um, okay, great, great. Because what a part of what's important is they have a lot of references in yes, here. Yes, so people yes. can read more about what all this is. Yes. And they can then decide whether or not I'm telling the truth. <laughs> or I'm... Or I'm <laughs> But also, it's like it's like a thing with all the emotions, you know. It's other words, you can yeah. hear it, yeah, 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 you can see it, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jim, thanks a lot, brother. Thank you. Okay, it's fun. We'll talk soon. Yes.